Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Go ahead and turn there. This is what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. So, to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Father, speak to us this morning through your word. Thank you for uh, leaving the thorn in Paul's flesh so many years ago. Thank you for inspiring him to write these words that are from you for us. And Lord, as we think about the thorns in our lives this morning and why you may or may not have removed them yet, We celebrate the fact that you can speak these words to us just the same as you spoke them to Paul. My grace is sufficient for you. And Lord, I pray that that truth would resound in our hearts this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Charles Spurgeon, a great preacher, once said, what would become of some people if they were always in good health or if they were always prospering? What would become of people? If everything was always going well. He says, Tribulation is the black dog that goes after the stray sheep and barks them back to the good shepherd. I thank God that there are such things as the visitations of correction and holy discipline to preserve our spirit and bring us back to Christ. A few weeks ago, we started a new study that's going to carry us all the way through summer called Hold On, Trusting God Through suffering. And our purpose in studying something that can be honestly hard to talk about, hard to preach about, hard to listen to over and over again, I just want you to know, I'm going to remind you again, I'm aware of that. That's why we're doing it. The purpose of our study is so that we might better perceive God's presence and purpose in our suffering. In other words, that we might have a strong theology of suffering, that we might understand the purposes that God has in suffering. The Bible has a lot to say about how God uses suffering in our lives, a lot to say about how God uses suffering in our lives, and it can only benefit us as his people, as his church, to better understand how he draws near and how he uses suffering in our lives. It can only benefit us to think about this, to talk about this, to study what God's word has to say about this. Because we've all been there, right? Every single person in this room knows the pain and the frustration of prolonged suffering. Suffering that just doesn't seem to have an end. Each one of us has deeply experienced what it's like to have some important part of our lives broken, painful, or difficult, and what it's like to pray and pray and pray and plead with God to remove that suffering from our lives, to relieve that pain, to fix what's broken, to ease that suffering to no avail. You've been there before? Lord, please make this suffering end. And then he doesn't. The language that Paul uses here in 2 Corinthians to describe that is a thorn in the flesh. Paul said he had a thorn in the flesh that weakened him to the point of, he says, pleading with God to remove it. Pleading with God to remove it. Not once, not twice, but three times, indicating ongoing, repeated pleading with the Lord on his knees before the Lord, imploring God to remove this thorn. But God didn't remove it. He left the thorn. He left Paul in his weakness. He left Paul in his suffering. He left him in his pain. He left the thorn in his flesh. And the question that we need to ask ourselves this morning is why? 
Why would God do that, right? Because we believe God is good. We believe God is sovereign. We believe God is loving. We believe God is kind and compassionate. We believe all these things. We also believe that God is powerful, right? And so how do we reconcile all of that with an apostle even, like Paul, pleading with God to remove something and him not doing it? How do we reconcile those things? Why does God leave the thorns? Even when we plead with him to remove them. And so if you've ever wanted to know or you've spent a lot of time thinking and praying, asking God, why won't you take this thorn out of my life? Why won't you remove this suffering? And you've been wondering what God's answer to that is. It's right here in 2 Corinthians. This is the main idea in your outline this morning. If you're following along and you want to fill in those blanks. God graciously lets us wait in our weakness so that we might learn to rely on the strength of of his grace. God is kind enough to leave us weak. He's kind enough to leave the thorns so that we might learn to rely on the strength and sufficiency of his grace, because only those weakened by thorns can be strengthened by God's grace. And so as we sit in our suffering, we sit in our praying, praying, and we sit in our pleading with the Lord to remove our thorns in his grace, in his love, in his mercy, he just might leave them there because he's kind. Not because he doesn't care, not because he's distant, not because he's not listening, but in fact because of the opposite of all those things, because he is listening, because he does care, and because he is kind for this reason, so that we might learn to rely on the strength of his grace. So let's look at 2 Corinthians 12. Let's see how a sovereign king uses even the thorns in our lives to strengthen us. Here's what Paul says, verse 7. Follow along with me in your Bibles. So, to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Conceited. Paul says twice that God allowed a thorn in his flesh or a messenger of Satan into his life and allowed it to remain in his life in order to, he says it twice, right, at the beginning and the end of the sentence, to keep me from becoming conceited. Paul knew exactly why God left the thorn there. So to keep me from becoming conceited, to keep me from becoming conceited in one sentence. Paul very clearly understands why God is keeping this thorn in him. The thorn had a purpose. And what better imagery than suffering that just sticks in our lives than a thorn, right? Uh, Early on in my ministry, we had an event uh, with the youth group called Fugitives, and it was basically a giant game of hide-and-seek. We usually went to Woodfield Mall, which is one of the biggest malls in the world, and uh, the leaders would dress up in disguise, and the kids and teams would have to come find us, and it was a blast, at least for the leaders. The kids had fun too. I don't really know why, but we had a lot more fun. One year, we decided to switch it up. We decided to go to the local forest preserve, We all bought camo, and it was the same thing. You have to come find us in the woods. Now, this seemed, this was, I don't know, this was like 13 or 14 years ago. It seemed safer at the time in the forest preserve. Now I'm confessing all of my errors to you. But the point is, we're running uh, in the woods from these kids. I've got these two kids chasing me, and um, I'm running up this hill trying to get away from them, and it's so steep, and I actually start to fall backwards. And so I reach out, and I grab the thing nearest me, And I grab it as hard as I can, and I pull myself up by it, and it just happened to be a thorn bush. And I grabbed with all my strength. I actually grabbed with both hands. I pulled myself up, and it hurt. And I got away, which is really the important thing. (laughs) But for weeks, actually, after that, I had thorns in my hands. If you've ever gotten thorns stuck in your body anywhere, your hands is really not the place where you want those thorns. I was still a student in college at the time. I tried to dig all of them out. Don't know how many there were. I got rid of a lot of them, but I had one in particular right on the tip of a finger, and I could not get it out. And it made me suffer. It honestly was crippling. It sounds kind of funny to talk about because it's so small and it was just like in the tip of my finger, right? But it actually made everything in life hard. I suffered. And I got so frustrated. I struggled to pay attention in classes because it hurt. I struggled to do my homework because I couldn't type or hold a pen or a pencil. I struggled to eat because I couldn't hold a fork. I had to eat left-handed, which is hard for a right-handed person, all because of this little thorn in my flesh. 
And it was lodged so deeply in there, and I couldn't get it out, and it started to impact every area of my life. It started to make everything in my life hard and frustrating and difficult, and it started to make me feel weaker and weaker and weaker because it started to hurt more, and I couldn't do anything to remove it. And I think that's a good example I think that's why, maybe that's not exactly what Paul was envisioning. I don't know if he ever played fugitives with his youth group at the church in Corinth. But I do know that he understood what I'm talking about. He understood that that's what suffering is, that difficult, painful suffering in our lives, that's how it makes us feel weak, helpless, hurting, like everything's falling apart and there's nothing we can do about it. And so we do what Paul did. We turn to God because we know that he can do something about it. And we pray and we plead and we hope that he will do something about it because thorns, as small or large as they may be, they hurt. And when they lodge themselves in our lives and there's nothing we can do to remove them, it's painful. And these thorns don't just show up for no reason, Paul says. He gives dual credit to them. He acknowledges this. I don't know if you noticed this or not, but he acknowledges that his thorns are somehow both given by God and also a messenger of Satan. Given by God and a messenger of Satan. Now, I don't think we should overcomplicate this. I think it would be easy to overcomplicate this. But as Christians, we believe God is sovereign, yes? We believe God is king. We believe God is in control. We believe God is all-powerful. And as Christians, we also believe that there's a very real enemy who is hell-bent on causing suffering. That's what he wants more than anything in the world, is to cause suffering, to draw us away from the Lord and cause us agony. Or in Paul's words, he's determined to harass us. The Greek word literally means to strike with the fist. And it paints this picture of of Satan just using Paul as a punching bag over and over and over again. That's what Satan wants to do. That's what Satan does in our lives through suffering. And Paul doesn't seem to struggle one bit with acknowledging these realities, that there is an evil enemy out there who wants to cause us pain and suffering, and yet that there is a kind, loving hand of a sovereign king also working in our lives. And that his hands are actually a lot bigger and a lot more powerful and a lot more control than the fists of the devil. So much so that he's even able to use the harassment, the punching bagness of the devil for our good. And so we shouldn't get a headache trying to think about these things and trying to reconcile these things. Okay, if you believe what the Bible teaches, you believe that there is a real enemy trying to cause suffering in your life. And you also believe that there is a good, sovereign God who is in control. And Paul doesn't even seem to think twice about it. So we've probably already thought more about it than we need to. So I'm going to move on. And the good, in Paul's case, God is using these thorns for our good. And in Paul's case, he twice states this again as to keep me from becoming conceited. Paul had just been talking in chapter 12 about how he had all these revelations from the Lord, about how he had these extremely powerful, intimate experiences with God Almighty. And then he immediately starts talking about how God gave him this thorn to keep him from becoming spiritually arrogant. He allowed Paul to suffer with this thorn in his weakness and in his pain in order to keep him humble. Sometimes God leaves the thorns in our lives to give us a kind, gracious reminder of our own weakness. God does not want you to forget how weak you are. He does not want me to forget how weak I am. And quick side note, like we live in a culture that doesn't want to think about that, right? You're not weak, you're strong. You're powerful. And God's like, no, you're not. You're nothing. You're weak. You're fragile. You're broken. And I don't want you to forget about that. And so sometimes God uses thorns like he has used Paul's here to graciously bestow weakness awareness. Awareness of just how weak we really are. And letting us sit there in the reality of our own weakness is not a cruel thing. It is an incredibly, incredibly kind thing that God does. 
It sounds like a cruel thing, doesn't it? I want to remind you of how weak you are. It sounds like that, but it's not. It's actually incredibly kind. It's an act of grace because, in fact, the reality of our own weakness is what drives us to Christ in the first place, is it not? Like understanding that I'm a weak, fragile, helpless person, broken by sin, unable to do anything in my life without His grace, it's what drives us to Christ. It's what drives us to look for His strength. It's the foundation of our relationship with Christ. It's right there at the core with all these other things is reminding ourselves of just how weak we really are, just how unable to do anything about the predicament of sin in our lives we really are. So our, actually, our whole life with God kind of hinges on being reminded that we're weak, that we're fragile, and that we need a strong God. And so God uses thorns to do that. He uses thorns to bestow weakness, awareness. The problem is, is that as time goes on in our Christian lives, as we mature, as we grow, unfortunately we have a tendency not to grow in humility, not to grow in weakness, awareness, but to grow instead in arrogance and conceitedness. We allow those things to set back in and we become self-righteous, sanctimonious, spiritual egomaniacs all over again. We get proud again. We get arrogant again. We start pointing fingers again. We start praying like the guy in the temple that said, thank you, God, I'm not like that guy. We start praying like that. We start thinking like that again. We become self-righteous, sanctimonious, spiritual egomaniacs. And we start to stray, therefore, from the very foundation of our faith, the acknowledgement of our own weakness, the acknowledgement of our own fragility. And so God, being the kind, sovereign king that he is, he graciously uses even Satan using us as a punching bag, even the thorns in our lives to keep us weakness aware, to keep us understanding that we need him for strength, to keep us in a regular state of God-reliance rather than self-reliance. Because a life of weakness, and if you would say you've lived a life of weakness, you understand I'm talking about a life of weakness is a life spent near the Lord. A life of weakness, a life of thorns is a life spent trusting him and relying on him for strength, which is far better than a life without thorns lived in self-righteousness. God uses the thorns to keep us aware of our weakness and our need for him. And yet, in spite of all that being true, uh, the pain of Paul's thorn was so great and so difficult that in verse 8 he says, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. Paul knew God had purpose in his suffering. Paul knew God was using this in these ways, and yet he gets on his knees and he's pleading with the Lord, again, not once, not twice, but three times that it should leave me. The word pleaded is a strong one. It means begging up close and personal. To like approach somebody and look them in the eye and say, please don't do this. Please relieve this suffering. Please take action. Pull this thorn out of my flesh. And by the way, this is a good thing to do. Okay, Paul would want us to do this. The first, second, and third place that we should turn when there's suffering in our lives is the Lord in prayer. The fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, infinite number of times we should turn when there's suffering in our lives is the Lord in prayer. It is not wrong to ask God to remove thorns. Just because God is using suffering and God has a purpose in that suffering and he's drawing near to us in that suffering doesn't mean it's wrong to say, Lord, please make it stop. He wants us to come to him with those requests. And it may be his pleasure to remove them. Or it may not. In this life, we are regularly pierced and plagued by varieties of thorns which we are helpless to remove. Thorns of injustice and inequality. Thorns of abuse in mistreatment, thorns of physical, mental, emotional illness, thorns of addictions and burdens, thorns of isolation and loneliness, pain and sorrow and counseling and treatment and medicine and intercession can only do so much good with these pains. Can they fail to solve the actual problem? And what is a Christian supposed to do when that happens? What am I supposed to do as a Christian? What are you supposed to do as a Christian when nothing seems to be helping? When the thorn is still there and it still hurts and it's still plaguing us and God still hasn't removed it, what then do we do? Because let's be real, when God doesn't remove our thorns, 
when there's pain in our lives, when there's suffering in our lives, and it doesn't seem like God is doing anything about it, it's our natural reaction to become bitter with God, isn't it? It's our natural reaction to turn hostile toward God, to turn hostile toward others, and to turn pitying of ourselves. That's our natural reaction. When we're praying to God and they're suffering, we're saying, why aren't you doing something about this? Our natural reaction is bitter with God, hostile toward others, and self-pitying. That's where we run. It's all too easy to let resentment for the thorns turn into resentment for the God who didn't remove them. It's all too easy to suffer poorly, to not hold on, to not trust God through suffering, and to get tricked into falsely believing that the, the abusive fists that are punching us are God's and not Satan's. That God's permissive hand and unwillingness to remove our thorns are an act of cruelty and unfairness rather than an act of kindness. That's where we go. This is one of the main issues. If you ask people in the world who are not Christians, what issue do you have with Christianity? This is going to be at the top of the list. Why does God not do anything about the suffering in my life? Or I was a Christian, I grew up in church, I grew up believing all these things, and then deep suffering entered into my life, and God didn't do anything. So forget him. I gave up on him. I ran away from him. This is at the top of almost everybody who has run from God, who has ignored God's list. Why doesn't God do anything about the suffering in my life? And when we reach that place in our hearts as maybe some of us have been before, maybe some of you are right now, this is what God would say to you. Again, if you're wondering, what would God say to me? If I'm just pleading with him, I've been pleading with him for so long to remove this suffering, what would God say to me? I've been running from him. I've been bitter with him. I've been hostile toward others. I've been pitying of myself. What is God's message for me? This is what it is. He said to me in verse nine, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. That's God's answer to you. Why am I suffering, God? Why are you not doing anything about my suffering? Please remove this suffering from my life. God's answer, my grace is all you need. My power is made perfect in your weakness. God graciously lets us wait in our weakness and in our suffering so that, we, again, we might learn to rely on the strength of his grace, on the sufficiency of his grace. He lets us experience the insufficiency of ourselves, of our power, so that we can experience the sufficiency of him and his grace and his power. He uses thorns to remind us of our weakness so that he can also remind us of his strength and his grace. He says, my power is made perfect in your weakness. Your thorns, your suffering, he says, are the perfect backdrop for my power and my grace. God lets us suffer with thorns to help us learn to cherish his grace. Do you cherish the grace of God? Just this word just popped into my head this week as I'm preparing this message and I'm thinking about, do I cherish, do I like, treasure the love of God? Do I treasure the grace of God? Is it somewhere I turn is it something I love so deeply? Do I really cherish his grace? Or do I take it for granted? Do I not think that often about it? Do I spend more time pleading with him to remove all of these things instead of cherishing his grace? He lets us have these thorns so that we can learn to cherish his grace. By the way, there's nothing more important in life than cherishing the grace of God. There's nothing more important in the church than cherishing the grace of God. And God graciously uses thorns to help us learn to do that. The beauty and the wonder and the power of God's grace are made known and experienced and comprehended and cherished only by hearts 
that linger in weakness awareness, only by hearts plagued by thorns. And since we can't and won't maintain a heart like that on our own, because we're prideful, because we're arrogant, because we're sinful people, God leaves the thorns so that we will come to fully, truly grasp in our heart of hearts that the favor and the grace of God truly is sufficient, truly is all that you need. I remember reading this verse in college and going, yeah, I mean, I know it's sufficient, but don't we need a lot of other things too? You know, and I I think that's a common thought, like, okay, I get it. I understand that God's grace is sufficient, but this thorn really stinks. This suffering in my life is really painful. How is God's grace helping me get this thorn out of my life, right? And that's, that's the bitterness that sets in. That's the not trusting God that sets in. God is leaving those things there in our lives to help us understand his grace really is all that we need. His grace really is worth cherishing, His kindness to us, his love for us, his his grace to us in Christ really is worth cherishing. It truly is sufficient. And no matter how many or how large or how painful the thorns, the suffering, no matter how violent the attacks of Satan, no matter how many times we've prayed or how long we've waited in vain, if we have his grace, if we have his power in our weakness, we really, really, really do have all that we need. Waiting in weakness is how God continually draws us back to himself. It's like Spurgeon said, it's the black dog that barks the shepherd back to the sheep. Because you know what a sheep without a shepherd is? Dead. Quickly. And God uses the thorns, he uses the suffering to bark us back to him. To help us see how good he is. To help us see what a kind, loving shepherd he is to help us cherish his grace. And we've got to constantly be letting that truth sink deeper and deeper into our hearts. It's like we talked about last week. We've got to be aware of these things before they happen, right? Because if we're not thinking about these things, then when the suffering comes, if we're not thinking about how we ought to be cherishing the grace of God and how God's grace is sufficient, if we're not thinking about all that and then suffering hits, that's not what we're thinking about anymore. We need to be talking about this stuff before the suffering actually hits, And so as we do that, hopefully we'll learn what Paul did, that the power of God works most beautifully and evidently in our lives when we're at our weakest. And that waiting and weakness draws us ever nearer to the good shepherd. Weakness draws us nearer to the strong one. And Christ himself is the ultimate example that the power of God is manifested in weakness, that in weakness... His power is made known. And because that's true, Paul says in the second part of verse 9, therefore, just think about this verse for a minute, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly in my weakness, weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I don't need my strength. My strength is not sufficient. What I'm not going to do is stand up and pretend I'm strong. What I'm not going to do is stand up and pretend that I've got what it takes to handle this suffering. Instead, Paul says, I'm going to boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses. I have decided, since all of this is true, not to pray a fourth time and a fifth time and a sixth time for the removal of my thorn, but instead to celebrate it. I'm actually going to celebrate my thorn. I'm going to rejoice in it all the more. I'm going to lift my head up high and boast about this thorn because when I do that, The sufficiency of God's grace and the strength of God's power will surround me and empower me and shine through me all the more. And that's what I want. Isn't that amazing? This is different than what you see in other philosophies and other religions of the world. I'm going to celebrate my suffering. I'm going to celebrate that I've got a thorn in my life, that I've got pain in my life, that God isn't removing And in our thorn-plagued weakness, that we can lift our hands up high and lift our heads up high and boast in the weakness that plagues us. Because when we do that, his power rests on us and shines through us for the world to see. That means that your thorn, the one that you've been pleading with God to remove for however long, the one so deeply lodged in your life that it seems to be ruining everything little by little, you can actually celebrate it. 
You don't have to keep complaining about it. You don't have to keep whining about it. You don't have to keep turning to the Lord and pleading with him to remove it. You can actually stop and celebrate it. Now, you're you're probably thinking, if you're like me, you're thinking, okay, but what does that mean? How am I supposed to do that? That doesn't make any sense. Here's what Paul is saying. You can celebrate your weakness. You can boast in that thorn because we are never stronger in Christ than when we are weakest in ourselves. We're never stronger in Christ than when we are weakest in ourselves. And therefore, these immovable thorns of weakness, these great sources of pain and misery that we can't remove, they're actually enabling us to experience the grace and the power of God more fully than we could have if God had removed it the first time we'd asked. God is actually using that pain, he's actually using that suffering to draw you near, to bring you back, to show you his goodness, to show you his kindness, to show you his strength. And that's a good thing. Seeing the goodness of God, seeing the the faithfulness of God, seeing the grace and the kindness and the compassion of a good shepherd, we're going to experience that, we're going to see that, we're going to feel that, we're going to believe that most deeply when the black dog is barking us back to the shepherd. Because we're never stronger in Christ than when we are weakest in ourselves. The thorns in your life are being utilized by God for your good, to bring you back to him. God in his sovereign power and his sovereign love has hijacked the schemes of Satan and he's actually using them to help you experience his goodness all the more his kindness on on grace and compassion all the more. The thorns in our lives are therefore, like Paul is saying, not something to despise or hate or bemoan or be crushed by, but rather the thorns are something to celebrate with gladness, with joy all the more. And when we start seeing our thorns of pain and our thorns of suffering as thorns of grace, And we start thanking God for doing that, for using those things, for drawing us near, for keeping us near to his power, keeping us near to his grace through the reminder of our own weakness. Only then will the fullness of Christ's power and goodness and compassion really rest upon us. Like Paul says, only then will we truly understand the sufficiency of his grace. And again, if you question that, if you're like, I just don't really know that God's grace is sufficient, I would expect more thorns in your life. God's going to use those to help you understand that his grace really is enough. Even the thorns, even the suffering God is using for our good. But it's not only for our good, it's not only for our sake that God leaves the thorns, it's also for the sake of Christ. Paul says in verse 10, look at this verse with me. For the sake of Christ then, not just because God is using these things for my good, but for the sake of Christ then, I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I will boast in my weakness, in my insults, in my hardships, my persecutions and calamities. I will boast in them gladly, not only because God is using them for my good, but for the sake of Christ and for the sake of his glory in this world because when our powerful God works through our known weakness, all the glory belongs to him, right? When you're broken and the world knows you're broken, when you're fragile and you're weak and the world knows you're fragile and weak and they see you celebrating those things and they see you strong and they see how sufficient God's grace is in your life, he gets all the glory, not you. And all the world will see, be able to see that anything that we do, anything that we are, in spite of our suffering, could only possibly be Christ's power through our weakness. And they'll see how powerful he is. They'll see how good he is. They'll see how wonderful he is. They'll see how worthy of glory he is. We see this pattern all throughout the Bible's teaching on suffering. And it's this, that God graciously lets us suffer with our thorns, both for our good and for his glory. And we can therefore boast all the more gladly and be truly content with weaknesses and insults and hardships and persecutions and calamities, thorns of any kind that God allows to remain in our lives because we know that he will get more of the glory that he deserves. 
through those sufferings. And if you're really a follower of Jesus, that's what you want more than anything in the world. You want the world to know how good he is. You want the world to know how glorious he is. And the more you suffer, the more that happens. The more you are barked back to the good shepherd, the more the world sees how good of a shepherd he really is. So now we've answered this question. We, answer, we started asking this question, why? Why does God do this? I've given you a bunch of answers this morning. Why does God leave the thorns in our lives? The follow-up question we need to ask is, am I like Paul? Am I content with that? Or am I not content with that? Am I actually pleased to continue waiting in my weakness, waiting in my thorns, because I understand that God is using them to give me this immersive experience of his goodness and grace and compassion? Or I'm going to say, forget that and ask God to remove that suffering a fourth time. And ask God to remove that suffering a fifth time and a sixth time to grow increasingly impatient, increasingly resentful, increasingly bitter at God day by day as he doesn't remove that suffering. Because those are your choices. Keep getting angry at him. Keep getting bitter at him. Keep thinking that somehow he's the enemy, that he's the black dog, but he's not. He's the good shepherd. He's using the black dog to bring you back to him. God is graciously reminding you of your own weakness so that you might experience his grace and be enveloped by his grace and his power more fully. It's for your good. There's nothing better in this life than experiencing the grace of God, than experiencing the compassion and the love of a good shepherd. It's for your good and it's for his glory that he has left that thorn in your life. And so no matter what ailments plague you, no matter what fears destroy your peace, no matter what thorns continually pierce your life, you can know with certainty that if you are in Christ, we have a beautiful promise of the sufficiency of God's grace. It's everything. It's all that we need. And all this, this, this beautiful reversal that you see, right? This doesn't make sense in a lot of ways, right? You think like, how is God using pain and suffering in my life to bring me? Tim, this doesn't make sense. It's this beautiful reversal. It can only be true in our lives because Jesus, our King, endured Satan's ultimate attack. The greatest thorn in existence, death, to pierce him. Not only did he bear a crown of thorns upon his perfect head to symbolize this, but the word for thorn can also mean a stake or a nail, three of which pierced his hands and his feet to the cross. And by enduring Satan's ultimate thorn on the cross, by silently taking Satan's vicious blows, Jesus ultimately displays that the power of God at work in weakness. Because even though he was killed that day, he didn't stay dead. He rose again. Satan's thorns couldn't stop him. The weakness of the cross resulted in the power of the resurrection. And by his grace, we're invited into that. To share in that power, to experience that new resurrection life. Our God is so mighty and so loving and so kind that he bore the ultimate thorns in the flesh so that we could experience his grace and power rather than sorrow and death like we deserve. Talk about the sufficiency of grace. That he bore the thorns on the cross so that we could experience his grace. What more could we need than that? How good he is. To him be all glory. And because he has done that, because that's the God that he is, like Paul, we can be content in our suffering. We can boast in our suffering because it is through them that we experience that sufficiency and the power of God's grace on a level that we could never comprehend otherwise. And so if you've been asking God to remove your thorns for longer than you can remember, don't become demoralized. Keep praying, keep bringing those things to him, but also be content. Don't become embittered against God. Don't hate him. Don't run from him. Don't keep pitying yourself. Be like Paul, be content, be well-pleased in your suffering, knowing that God is allowing you to wait with those thorns in, you, in your life to give you something far more incredible than anything you could imagine, an experience of the sufficiency of his grace, of his power in your weakness. Thank the Lord for your thorns.
Let's pray. Father God, I'm a weak man. Lord, and you know the sufferings. You know the thorns in my life. You know the thorns and the pains in every person in this room's life, Lord. Lord, I just want to take a minute for every time that I failed to do this, for every time we have all failed to do this, Lord, to ask for your forgiveness and to say thank you. Thank you for the wolves out there. Thank you for the black dogs out there that bark us back into your arms. Lord, there's no better place. There's no more wonderful place. There's no safer place than in the arms of the good shepherd. Thank you, Lord, for using things to bring us back to you because we won't do it on our own. We don't have that resolve. We don't have that strength. We don't have that power in ourselves. We are weak. We are weak, wandering, helpless shepherds, Lord. Thank you for using thorns in our lives to remind us of that and to remind us of how badly we need you, to remind us of how sufficient your grace is, of how strong and how powerful your grace is. Lord, I just want to ask right now that if there is someone in this room who is enduring immense suffering right now, that you would help them experience the sufficiency of your grace that you would help them see that because Jesus bore the thorns on the cross, they can have new life, they can have freedom, they can have a new heart, a new mind, a new way of living, new hope, new joy. Lord, show that to the people in this room, all of us. Show that especially to those who have never experienced this before, who have never truly believed this before. Help them to see your grace is sufficient that you're a good shepherd, that the suffering in their lives is not because you are not good, it's because you are good, it's not because you don't care, it's because you do care. Use the pain in our lives, Lord, to draw us to you and to keep us nearby. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.